Welcome to Organizational Research Methods, Storytelling in Action. I'm filming things for a new book I'm doing. My name is David Boji, and you can get more material and actual figures on what I'm going to demonstrate at davidboji.com. Put slash 448 for the consulting if you're doing system consulting. And if you're just doing advanced systems theory, put David Boji slash 655. Today's seminar topic is going to be about Plato and some of the amazing things he can contribute to organization research methods. One of which is the conversational interview. Let's just stop doing those silly structured, semi-structured interviews and start having conversations with people that are dialectic and really explore the concepts and definitions that they're struggling with and we can help them. Second, I want to bring to your attention the kinds of systems that Plato wrote about in the Republic. Democracy, which was the warrior system where you went out and got slaves and wealth by conquering other cities, other nations. Then you had the oligarchy where all those wars got a little hectic and so wealth paid for slaves and wealth become the in all and be all of that society and that system of governance. And the rich separated from the poor and there became a gap and the poor and the rich no longer moved in the same circle and the rich became afraid to give guns to the poor for fear of what they might do in their warrior self and they might take back and they might take back the lands etc so that gave way to democracy, the poor getting a vote, the poor getting to choose a leader who might be poor, might be rich. But of course, in oligarchy, the corporate oligarchy we have today, the, the deck is stacked and unless you've got the lobby support to really pay for your election, uh, you being poor and getting elected is not very likely. So then we move to the next possibility which is how democracy erupts into chaos and disorder according to Plato. This is his theory. And there's a call for the tyrant the champion of the people to come forward and to bring back order and discipline and to have the good deal in negotiations with other nations. And the tyrant is a bit of a bully, but promises to bring order, reopen those coal mines, tap those oil fields, do away with the EPA, do away with public education, etc., etc., etc. And people are, are devotees to the tyrant. And even if the tyrant makes up facts, and even if we have fact checking, and a thousand positivists check the facts, the tyrant still has their following and people who vote against their own self interest. or their own higher interest anyway. So, democracy, oligarchy, democracy, and the tyrant. Plato dialectically opposed these with his utopia, which was the philosopher king who would work for free demand nothing for themselves and lead the people to be educated citizens 
where everybody can be an educated citizen. Everybody could attend university. We had that after World War II. It was affordable. You didn't have to go into life debt and mortgage a house to go pay for a college education for an undergraduate. And education wasn't about stamping your ticket, punching your ticket for some sort of career. It was about learning the four virtues. What is it to be true? What is truth? What is it to be just? What is it to be aesthetically beautiful? What is it to be equitable? These were the main principles, the main virtues. And at the center of this was freedom. How to not be a slave. How to not be a slave captured by the warrior in democracy, not to be a slave that's captured as a wage slave in oligarchy. How not to be a drone slave in a democracy where the media pumps you full of propaganda and you follow the tyrant anywhere where the tyrant wants to go in the tyrant phase. So let's be clear and truthful. Plato knew about slavery. He condoned slavery for those that weren't going to be the philosopher kings, the warriors, the tradespeople, the craftspeople. Some grounded theory that's on the website. First wave, Glasser and Strauss, 1967, suffers from epistemic fallacy. Second wave, Strauss and Corbin, 1994, the positivism fallacy. Third wave, bunch of different authors, Clark, Chemez, Mills, suffers from the social constructivism fallacy. Now I want to introduce the fourth wave, myself and my colleagues, and we want to do some relational process ontologies with Plato, Hegel, Marx and Engels, Follett, Heidegger, Bashkar, Barad. We're interested in Zizek and Breyer and many others and they will be featured in the series that I'm doing. Today it's Plato, thank you. I wanna lay out a spiral for you here, and it's grounded theory. So here we are in the ground, in the first world, dig it in with the stick here. That number one, is the first wave or first world, W-H-O-R-L, of grounded theory, which was all about induction. Like you go out, you interview people, you observe, you come up with a theory, and you write it up. Now the problem with the first wave is called the fallacy of induction. That that epistemic fallacy is that you're not actually verifying your theory and you're not actually attempting to falsify it. So people like Karl Popper and Roy Bashkar, that we'll get to eventually, they are very concerned about the fallacy here of the first wave of grounded theory, as I call it. They don't write about grounded theory, but I'm going to write about it here. Now let's look at the second world of grounded theory. And they try to compensate for the inductive fallacy in number one and the second wave by having lots of positivistic coding. You, you collect your inductive observations and interview comments, you transcribe everything, and you go through this coding ritual of positivism that's supposed to get you more rigor. But the problem is that that rigor doesn't really solve the epistemic fallacy problem of induction and it doesn't solve the new one of positivism that you've slapped on top of it. So they've gone to the third wave or third world, the spiral of grounded theory. So that third world is called social constructivism. 
and they sort of say, hey, let's not have quite so much positivism, still have the induction, but be relativistic about it. So you have a perspective, I have a perspective, they have another perspective. It's all socially constructed through language games. So what the heck? Let's not worry about these fallacies of induction or the fallacy of positivism. And let's just go out there and do social construction. Now the problem is, and why we need this bigger fourth wave that this series is about, the fourth wave is headed towards ontology. Now ontology says, especially if you do Roy Bashkar's work, which we'll get to later, and even Plato that we're going to talk about today, is that if you do induction, you better have falsification and verification. You better at least have a dialogue with the people, a conversational dialectic, where you try to falsify the concepts and definitions the other is coming up with, and your own concepts and definitions. And it's not about positivism, and it's beyond social construction, because now we're talking about what's called social materiality. That we're in here on the ground, and as Bruno Latour says, social construction has the fallacy that they don't understand a damn thing about construction and even less about the social. So the social construction, and when we get to Heidegger, we have some tadpoles flipping about, maybe they're little frogs actually, and they are saying to the social constructions, hey, you have to ground yourself in being in the world, as Heidegger says, being in space, being in time, like we're in the time of the season and the hours of the day, and we're in this space, time, but also there's a mattering going on here. With the rain, there's a mattering of this pond. There's a mattering of this debris. There's a mattering of the eight worlds of Plato and his idea of what the solar system looked like with the Earth at the center and the sun orbiting around it. So that's what I wanted to say, that this whole series is about moving from the first world of grounded theory, the fallacy of induction, through the second world, the fallacy of positivism, through the third world, the fallacy of social constructivism. So we get to a social materiality understanding of systems and consulting, and we can then step forward into what's called relational process ontologies. And the one that we're going to look at today is Plato's relational ontology. And here I've laid out the eight worlds of Plato, uh, his idea of the solar system with the Earth in the center, and the various planets out to the sun that are spinning around and orbiting the Earth. Now we know now that the sun is in the center and the Earth is one of those orbiting planets, but hey, in his day, they had a little problem with their positivism. So let's, let's look at the twisted spiral and make a little diagram of it for you. So we have a diagram of the double twisted spiral. It's my own depiction. And it shows the eight upward whirls nested inside of each other that the three sisters of fate are twisting. And the downward spiral where the unjust goes that also has eight whirls. And these upward spiral whirls and the downward ones are entangled so that you spin one one way, the others will move the opposite way. Nevertheless, his double twisted spiral of the upward spiral and the downward spiral with its eight nested worlds is light years ahead of what we have in organization studies in terms of models of organizational systems. We have the upward, wor upward worlds, the eight nested worlds, and they spin in either this direction or that direction is worlds, but the just 
can move up the spiral worlds, the just, people that are the just and equitable people, they move up and wait for their new incarnation. Now the unjust move down, the unjust move down in their worlds, they have eight worlds too, and they spin around. We'll put this bullet in the center here of the unjust worlds. And their eight worlds are linked, entangled to the eight worlds of the above, the up spiral. So the down spiral is entangled with the up spiral such that if you turn world number four clockwise, World number four down here is going to turn counterclockwise and vice versa. And that's true for each of the worlds that the three sisters of fate are spinning. So I hope that gives you some idea of what the double twisted spiral looks like and the eight nested worlds nested like little Russian dolls inside of each other, one inside the other, spinning in different directions depending on what the sisters of fate are going to do to the spiral of your life. Two forces in dialectic opposition. And Plato's dialectic is something I'm going to talk to you about today. And I want to tell you the story right here at this pond. Let's take a look at it. I walk over here just about every day. We've had a lot of rain recently, and there's all kinds of life happening. You can see, if you were here, little tadpoles, shrimp. Uh, this pond happens during the rainy season here in late July and August in Las Cruces, New Mexico. It's quite beautiful, but it'll be drained pretty soon and other things will take over. I want to talk to you about kind of the philosophy that Plato had. So I've set up a solar system here as Plato understood it. And here with this spindle or stick at the center is the Earth. Next we have Saturn. Next whirl or orbit. We have Venus. Then Mars. Then Mercury. Then Jupiter. Then the Sun. And then the stars in this eighth orbit. So there were eight what are called whirls. A whirl is a single orbit. And you have a spindle in the center. So let me tell you the story of Air, E-R. Air was a soldier who died in battle in Greece and was returned to his hometown probably Athens, and what happened is they put him on the funeral pyre, they lit it up on the tenth day, and he arose again from the dead and shared with him, and him being his father, his parents, the citizens, this image of the solar system with a certain planetary order the spindle in the middle. Now, he, he had the idea of a weaver spindle. So it would be a stick with a kind of a hook um, on the end of it. And the whirl would be a big object put, put around it. And you would spin the spindle and wind the yarn around it that came through the hook. And you'd get a whole bunch of yarn put together. Now, what 
Plato did with this, and naturally the order of the planets I showed you is incorrect, and we know from science that in the Copernican revolution that the sun is the center of the universe, not the earth, but in his day the earth was the center, so. But he had this idea of an upward spiral where the just would rise in an upward direction and a downward counter spiral where the unjust would descend and descend and descend and descend. Now the unique thing about this double spiral is it had eight nested whirls, like these eight nested circles here of the solar system. And there were eight whirls above and eight whirls below, W-H-O-R-L-S. And the counterpart whirl to the top whirl was linked, connected, entangled, we say today in quantum physics. So if you turn the top whirl one direction, the bottom whirl would turn the opposite direction. Now this, this was an amazing idea, and we have this concept uh, from Plato that we could um, choose when we were in the just up spiral, we could choose who we came back as. We could come back as an animal, a plant, a superstar, a warrior, a ruler, a slave. We could choose whatever we wanted. Now the unjust, they went down for punishment and an attitude readjustment. So when they came forth, they might choose to be when they were ready, a butterfly, or maybe one of these tadpoles here, or a mosquito, um, they might choose to be a hummingbird. We are responsible for the spirals we create. Uh, here you see kind of a, a downward spiral, turn it around here, downward spiral, where people have thrown their garbage. Uh, they are liquor bottle, their plastic bottle, their uh, shotgun shells, uh, parts of a bed frame, another liquor bottle, more shotgun shells. So here you have kind of in real time an example of kind of the beauty of nature, the destruction of nature, by human beings and you have the original idea of the eight nested worlds in Plato. Now how does the dialectic that Plato imagined work? First of all is the dialectic about concepts, defining concepts. You've heard of the Socratic methods, yes? Okay, so the Socratic dialogue. So you have a conversational approach that I think could be brought back into organization studies. If you go back to the Hawthorne studies, they tossed out the structured, semi-structured interview protocol with its predetermined questions and they changed their inquiry method to conversational interviewing. And I think it's inspired in part by Plato's dialectic. Now it has these steps involved that I'm going to talk to you about. And it is a way, I think, to have what Ole Kirkaby calls the proteptic, P-R-O-T-E-P-T-I-C, the proteptic. Now in the proteptic, you're working towards the virtues instead of the downward spiral of death. You're working towards the spiral, the up spiral of life. And you're trying to bring about a situation through, I think, five steps, I can summarize it in five short steps. 
first of all, you want to negate the definition of a organization or let's say a definition of a system since I'm teaching systems theory. So you want to negate that concept. So let's negate this concept of mass accumulation. So if somebody says, well, the system is inputs, throughputs, outputs, feedback loops. And our Socratic answer to that is, hey, what is this spiral? What type of system? And then we go to step two of the Socratic dialectic, if we want to call it that. And what are all the types of systems? Well, we've got systems that are mechanical. We've got systems that are organic and natured. We got systems that are highly artificial, like this pond here that was built by the county by berming up the surrounding desert sand. So we have a mechanistic system, an organic system. We got virtual systems in my filming this event. So there are many types of systems. So what is our definition of a system? Are they all just input, throughput, output with feedback loops? Or can we look at subtypes? Like can we have a mechanistic system? Does it ever wed or entangle with an organic system? So here we have a WD-40 can in the midst of an organic system. And we have an abandoned part of a, probably a chair or couch or something in the midst of the t growing tadpoles. So there are different subtypes in step three. Step four, we can say, okay, how does this ideal of Plato's philosopher king differ from the reality of the systems we see before us today? We have these natured systems. Here's a pine cone that has all kinds of spiral shapes to it look downward and look at it world by world, it's no wonder that Plato came up with this idea of an upward and a downward spiral. Now the fifth step is hopefully in your psych Socratic discourse, your questioning and answer, your conversational interview, you create a dialectic to explore the concept. In this case I'm exploring systems and I'm saying maybe we should go back and look at Plato seriously for not only his conversational interviewing approach, the Socratic method, but let's look at this spirals, these worlds within worlds that turn in different directions. Now, I want to tell you how these worlds turn. And there's three sisters of fate that can turn the worlds here. There's a sister of fate of the outer world. Let's put this pine cone here to represent her. And she is called Achesis. And she's the sister of the fate past. And she can turn these outer worlds, the one, this one and the one next to it, in either direction. You go to the center and you have another sister of fate, we'll put her here, and she can turn the inner worlds any direction she wants, and her name is Atropos. Now Atropos is the fate of the future, so you have the fate of the future in the center, and you have the fate of the past in the outer world, the star world, and the sun world in those days. Now, there's a, another sister of fate, and she's got the ability to be in the middle 
whirls. I'll put it right there with this part of a stick. And she can turn the whirls right next to her and the one she's on any direction. So when you died and you chose how you were going to come back, let's say you were the just or you were the unjust that had been out for an attitude adjustment and you chose to come back, well the three sisters of fate would spin your life path. The sister of fate of the past, the sister of fate of the future, the sister of fate of the present would spin those and you would come back into the world much like the tadpoles in this pond ready to emerge as a frog or a caterpillar ready to emerge as a butterfly you know and that metamorphosis is your responsibility your answerability ethically for the virtues that you wind in in your up spiral or the path of the down spiral that you take. So I hope that gives you some understanding of Plato's dialectic, the four Greek square virtues of the good, the just, the true, and the beautiful. Again, I recommend Ole Kirkaby's book on this. A, the Republic, had, in chapters 8 and 9, has really good accounts of the story of Air, E-R, and it doesn't use the word a double-twisted spiral, but it does talk about the eight worlds and how they're, they have an up world of the just, a down world of the unjust, people who don't pay attention to virtues and leave trash around like this. Where there is beauty, some people put trash. And this is David Boji, and I'll be back to do the next installment. And if you want to check out the website, it's davidboji.com slash 448 for the consulting course or davidboji.com and that's B-O-J-E, davidboji.com slash 655 for the systems course. So I invite you to come back another time and see another installment of Organization Research Methods, Storytelling in Action. And we're going to next deal with Hegel, his dialectic. We're going to deal with the whole set of virtues. We're going to carry those forward from Plato. The Greek square, it's called the good, the just, the true, and the beautiful, with freedom coming up the middle, and how to avoid or choose a spiral path to the just to the beautiful, the true, and the good in the spiral of life and not take the path of the down spiral into the injustice, the inequitable, the falsehood. All right, that leaves us with only to tell you that you can go to davidboji.com slash 655 for the systems course or davidboji.com slash 448 for the consulting course and you're welcome to join us and tune in there anytime thank you